for joining. Welcome to the NERT call on self-care. Samia, I'll pass it over to you to, to provide some welcoming remarks. Good day, everybody. This is Salvia Ramon, Chair of the New and Underused Technologies Caucus of the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition. Today, we are delighted to present a webinar on self-care technologies, an area of interest to caucus members. Without further ado, let me introduce Martha Brady, who will moderate the session. Over to you, Martha. Thank you, Somia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this uh, webinar today. So what's the buzz about self-care? I'm sure you're all wondering. You've come to the right place. We have a star-studded and full-packed panel today. Um, so I'm gonna just move us along. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. We're just working this out. Um, so I am Martha Brady the Director of Sexual and Reproductive Health at PATH. We're, we're, sorry, hold on one second. Trying to advance the slides, there we go. Okay, so I just wanted to, I'm gonna introduce the panelists at one go here. Um, they all have incredible backgrounds and resumes, which we're unfortunately we can't go into it too much today. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know uh, who's on the line, who's the, who's the panelists are. Malaise Yuwasi, she's the Director of Health and Partnerships at Kasha, you'll be hearing from her. Ben Bellows, the co-founder of NIVA. Uh, Danielle Harris, the senior program manager at Women Care Global. And Maggie Kilborn Book, senior program officer at PATH. So that's in our lineup today. Really looking forward to the discussion. Um, I'm gonna give us some opening kind of general framing around self-care. Some of you on the line may be familiar with this already, but others may not. So I thought I would give a little bit of an overview of that. Next slide, please. First, let me begin with, this is WHO's definition of self-care. So I won't read it out to you, but essentially, well, I will. Self-care is the ability of individuals, families, and communities to both promote health, prevent disease, maintain health, and to cope with illness and disability with or without a service provider. So I just wanna make a point here. Um, part of self-care is allowing women and men to have more direct access to technologies and products and services that they can use themselves we also do believe strongly that they need to be actually linked as well to primary health care next slide please um and just to remind us that self-care in itself is not new in fact women have been practicing self-care for millennium through the childbirth deliveries managing menstruation all of that has been happening forever what is new is we see a growth in the products and platforms making self-care more possible, healthier and safer. We also see a rapidly changing environment which is much more consumer-driven healthcare. That's true throughout the world, actually. We see that self-care has become more sophisticated and data-driven so that uh, clear links to digital health, I think are important here. And you'll, we'll hear a little bit about that later. And then I wanna say also, um, uh, uh, my background is in research, and there's actually evidence, clear evidence that shows that when people are active participants in their health care, that outcomes improve. We've seen this in the field among, in particular around the self-management of diabetes and other areas. And now we're looking at this specifically around sexual and reproductive health. Next slide. Just to let folks know that in the uh, WHO has developed consolidated guidelines on self-care interventions for sexual and reproductive health. Myself and a number of people probably on this line were involved in the development of those guidelines. I think someone from WHO hopefully is on the line. Um, and they were just issued the past year. WHO is in the process of rolling out these guidelines in uh, a number of countries. So just so you know, there's um, you can look this up. There's materials online about that. The next slide. Just to remind us when we're talking about self-care products, it, it goes across the, what we call the four Ds drugs, devices, diagnostics, and digital. So across those four areas, we see products that lend themselves to self-care. Just have some kind of visual examples here for people to see. Um, I won't go through each one, but you can, I think people can see that. Uh, next slide, please. Just examples, particularly from sexual reproductive health. We have, for example, the contraceptive self-injection, HIV self-testing, HPV, self sam in the lower right corner, the woman with that long tube is actually a, a way to do a vaginal uh, swabbing for HPV self-sampling. 
uh, emergency contraception and pericoital contraception are examples of self-care products, as is medication abortion, then the barrier contraceptive methods. There's also a range of fertility awareness and kind of um, mobile apps related to this, and then ovulation prediction kits and pregnancy testing. All of those sort of are examples of self-care products in the SRH space. There are others in the non-communicable disease space, but we're going to focus just on this here for today. Uh, next slide, please. Just wanted to kind of bring this up. We have been looking at this, applying the self-care lens specifically to women's health, and a couple of things we've learned, this came comes through the research over the past two years in this area, that both the concept and practice of self-care is appealing to many women, particularly younger women, but it does require knowledge and ability to access and to use resources. So the fundamentals of reproductive health literacy is really important. We see that the self-care can be a very much a rights-affirming and empowering approach to health care, um, and that it has potential to increase autonomy and agency. Uh, we see also that self-care at a sort of more of a policy level is an example of task shifting. You, you're, many of you are familiar with the task shifting concept, and this is sort of the ultimate in task shifting is down to the end users. And again, we would say uh, um, strengthening links to primary health care and to UHC generally. Okay, this is my last slide. Just to give you a sense of, um, again, I said there's an, an entire uh, body of work underway around self-care. And just some example of what the cur current happenings, there are publications, there have been blogs, there have been many panels on self-care at a, a variety of, of different um, conferences, and those will continue. As I mentioned, I showed you the slide of the WHL self-care guidelines have been launched and are being now rolled out in countries. Um, there is a self-care trailblazers group. I'm thinking some people on the line are probably part of that group, um, but that helps set the research advocacy and kind of policy agenda. There have been a, several country level consultations to build an advocacy roadmap. I just listed a few and there are more underway. Um, and then there have been a variety of research and tools have been developed um, and that you can hear more about or you can follow up with, with details of those. So I will, next slide, end there, I think. Yes, so the self-care movement has been building. So this is, um, I just wanted to put that out there initially um, so then we can move on to the rest of the panel to give a, a framing. So I know I'm speaking quickly, it's what I do, but I, I, I'm also mindful of time. So I'd like to hand it over to Melissa. Thank you, T Kasha, please go. Thank you, Martha. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Marlies and I work for Kasha. And for today's webinar, I'll be presenting on our e-commerce model and how it supports self-care for women that we serve. Next slide, please. And so, next slide. So to start us off, uh, I wanted to explain briefly what is Kasha. And Kasha is a direct-to-consumer e-commerce and insights platform that is built for low-income countries. And we started operations in Rwanda in 2016, eventually expanding to Kenya in, in 2018, officially launching in 2019. Our e-commerce platform is available online as well as offline, and I will explain insights uh, further down how the offline access works. And in terms of products, we have a variety of products that we carry on our platform. Uh, but when it comes to pharmaceutical products, we're truly optimized for self-care products, specifically around uh, the provision of sexual and reproductive health services. So we're talking about products such as the HIV self-test kits or emergency contraception as examples. Those are the most popular ones on our web website within our pharmaceutical range. Since we are an e-commerce platform, we also need to assure last mile delivery of orders and products to our customers. And so we have a last mile delivery system that works in both urban and rural areas. Since our platform is available offline, it does allow us to reach a variety of women across multiple socioeconomic backgrounds. And then the other key component of our business as well is that since we are a tech enabled platform, we're able to collect data in uh, real time and we provide consumer and market insights reports to certain companies or organizations that might be interested in learning more about some of the customer segments that we serve uh, so that they can optimize as well their services and products uh, to them. Next slide, please. Right. So, 
how can a person order um, cash back? So as I said, our platform is available offline and online, which means we have a variety of channels. Uh, the first channel that I'm going to explain is our offline channel, and this is through a USSD code that can be accessed uh, via any phone. It doesn't have to be a smartphone. Uh, once you dial this code, you access a menu that shows you the a variety of products that we have. You're able to select the product, select your shipment uh, option, and also payment option. And then a call center representative calls to organize delivery logistics. For our consumers that are online, we have uh, uh, two websites, so one for Rwanda and one for Kenya, and same with the USSD code. And it's this, a similar experience of any e-commerce platform where you would go, you're able to browse through our product categories as well, can add any product from emergency contraception, for example, or the HIV self-test kit. And again, um, add it to your basket and go through a checkout process where you provide us with your address, your preferred pay payment method, your shipping method. Um, and so that is purely online. And then the third channel is that we have a call center that customers can reach either by calling if they need support in ordering, maybe they're having challenges with our USSD system or our online platform. They can also reach out to them uh, via social media and WhatsApp as well. So social media would be channels such as Instagram or Facebook. Next slide, please. And so in terms of products that we have on our platform, we have three main categories. Those are menstrual care, personal care, and pharmaceutical products. And under personal care, we have other subcategories such as the mom and baby category or beauty and makeup. And we also offer telephone consultations on the health side with registered nurses and doctors around sexual reproductive health. This is a service we have in Rwanda and we're currently implementing the same model in Kenya. Uh, when it comes to pharmaceutical products, we have found across both of our countries of operations that self-care self products, and specifically around SRH, are the most popular ones. So again, here we're talking about the HIV self-test kit, uh, pregnancy tests, um, or uh, contraceptives such as emergency contraceptives or uh, condoms. And generally, when we collect insights from our consumers, they like ordering these types of products on our platform because it adds another layer of confidentiality that they're usually not able to, to have if they have to go to a pharmacy, for example, or a, clin a clinic to access these products. And when it's around sexual and reproductive health, the experience can be stigmatizing. So really an e-commerce model fits um, in this overall arching theme or model of self-care because not only are people enabled or empowered to be able to use products by on their own, but they're also able to have multiple channels to access them and uh, an e-commerce channel is more confidential and more convenient for them. So it makes the accessing the product easier. Next slide, please. And so again, looking at how, so I went over the types of products that we have um, and uh, our operator operations or ordering system. When it comes to delivery, we also offer our consumers multiple options. And so the first option is direct delivery to the consumer where they provide us with, with an address. It could be their home address or another address where they feel comfortable receiving the package and we deliver it directly to them uh, with our motto or Buddha driver. The second option is that we have a variety of pickup points within our cities of operations. Um, our office, for example, always serves as a pickup point, but we also have other areas such as uh, this clothing store, for example, in this picture, or hair salons, which are places where women go often that are convenient uh, and usually located in areas where maybe there might be a bus park nearby to sort of ease access to women uh, picking up their packages. And then the third option is to uh, go through Kasha agents. Uh, Kasha agents are women that we recruit in low-income communities who are trained uh, to support women in their communities in placing orders and um, uh, placing orders, troubleshooting if they have any issues. And then the agents also support with last mile delivery. In this scenario, our Mota or Boda driver uh, drops the package with the agent and the agent conducts last mile delivery to the customer. And so really to sum it up, since we have so many other panelists, uh, the Kasha model is an offline and online e-commerce platform with a variety of products that women can generally use uh, by themselves. 
and within the range of pharmaceutical products, our most popular products consistently remain uh, self-care products, and particularly uh, within the range of sexual reproductive health because of the added confidentiality and convenience that uh, our e-commerce model provides to our consumers. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Belize. It's so excellent and fabulous. I can't wait to have a discussion. We'd love to have, I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, questions. Um, and thank you for respecting time. So we're going to move on and we'll come back to that, hopefully, questions later. Thank you so much. We're moving on to Ben Bellows and Nivik. If you can hand over, handing the baton to you now, Ben. Thanks, Martha. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to jump in today's talk uh, with a broad framing or kind of stepping back a bit and thinking about self self care as user initiated care that it's the as martha was alluding to it's this issue of autonomy and agency and having the, the essentially the, the 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 aspects the the drive to seek care begins with the user and thinking of self-care really as that point at which the user decides to seek care so initiating care to begin in their everyday life uh, and it might be it begins around this notion of self-awareness so drawing from the bmj supplement that came out just prior to the who guidelines on self-care last year there was a couple of articles and this one in particular caught my attention the self this, this conceptual framework around self-care and if you think about self-care as this moment of self-awareness of self-help or self-determination to seek care and that then leading to, on this pathway or this health journey if you will into self-management um, which may involve engaging at certain points with the health system. And it could be at pharmacy, it could be at a health facility, but it's that idea of initiating that care into and deciding to seek some sort of support along a health journey. Now, that health journey often involves maybe uh, chronic conditions or uh, long-term conditions that require repeated points of care. They may be high-risk cases on the pyramid there on the left or they might be complex cases with comorbidities. It could be something around surgery. At the end of the day, I'm deciding or organizing or scheduling that surgical care that I need. But it is, at the end of the day, something that is initiated by the user. So I think it's an important point to keep in mind as we think about the power of digital to help accentuate or empower the consumer uh, in their self-awareness and ultimately in their pathway towards, um, or the, their, their direction, if you will, along that health journey that's a day-to-day -day process. So next slide. So for Nivi, when we think about putting the consumer at the center of self-care, the center of care, it for us is manifest or take shape in a conversational-based interface. So we use messaging, some SMS, we use WhatsApp, we use uh, Facebook Messenger, available messaging platforms, kind of popular messaging platforms that people use every day to raise awareness on the one hand, have conversations with individuals, and help understand where they're at conceptually, kind of psych psychologically, where they're at, how ready they are to initiate that care-seeking health journey. So I think that that state of readiness is very important. And in family planning, we have long had this notion of readiness to seek care uh, um, or understanding unmet need and demand. Uh, but this is, an, I think, a more generalized phenomenon when it comes to self-care, particularly on the digital platform. And the idea then is to, able, is to leverage that insight at scale and being able to deliver personalized health services at large numbers. So leveraging the power of personal uh, uh, technologies and digital technologies to deliver, to deliver personalized care, I think, is an important element of what we're doing at NIVI. And what we're seeing is a more generalized presentation or a generalized approach to digital health services in the self-care space. Uh, next slide, please. Now, why do we need to do this or why the, why the call for self-care? Certainly important in uh, throughout the world, a lot of demand for uh, more agency and more autonomy in seeking health care at every income level, if you will. But it's certainly acutely felt in areas where there may be underutilization, undersupply of health services, where the need to be very targeted and very timely in one's engagement with the health system to find those resources is so much more important because those supply side access points may be fewer, or may be harder to reach, may be more difficult to access. So I think it's an important point to think about as we think about the rationale for self-care. Uh, next slide, please. 
On the demand side, however, if we think about it as a market opportunity or the size of the opportunity here for Nivi, but also for Kasha, for Babylon, and for Ada Health and others operating in this digital health space, we're talking about nearly a billion people on the planet who live in low and middle income countries between the ages of 15 and 34 and who have access to either a phone for that SMS connection or a data connection for that Facebook or WhatsApp or um, WeChat or whatever digital platform you want to communicate through. So this opportunity is certainly one that is large and growing. Uh, GSMA had data, we looked up some data from, this is 2018, so now a couple of years back, but looking at the number of subscriptions in 2017 across these markets and where they're projected to go by 2025, and the trend is only up. So the number of people coming online year to year continues to increase, and it's a more generalized phenomenon where digital solutions can be that first entry point for raising awareness and helping consumers initiate their journey uh, along a health continuum. Next slide, please. So for Nivi, that initial engagement on the next, uh, if you go to the next slide, you see insights from each individual health journey. Are we on the next slide? Or did it hang just for me? Fun. There we go, perfect. All right, so on this particular slide, the way we're approaching it at Nivi is with this notion of initial marketing, and that marketing could be offline, it could be done through radio, for instance, it could be done through community mobilizers, or it could be done on, online through that social media news feed that we all see on Facebook or Google AdWords or any other marketing mechanism that we use now to raise awareness as a call to action. So we use it to, to flag it and bring it up into one into the users, the consumers' minds as a top priority, something that it's worth clicking through to. So once a user clicks through and asks their question to Nivi, they accept the terms and conditions, and they ask a question. They ask Nivi a question about whatever it is that's top of mind with respect to their health. Now, because of the nature of the adverts or the advertisements, it often is around family planning. We are operating in Kenya and in India currently. And in both countries, consumers are prompted or called to ask questions around reproductive health. That is where we have the content available. So they ask that question. In Kenya, we use artificial intelligence then to estimate what the intent is behind that specific question. If we detect key phrasing, for instance, around myths or misconceptions or side effects, we're able to generate or call up an automated conversation with respect to myths and misconceptions of a particular method or side effects and help consumers walk through in an automated fashion where possible answers to concerns that might be top of mind. So they move from engage to chat. The idea is that they're moving along this continuum and beginning to explore and surface ideas or questions they may have around a particular topic that the AI hopefully will have tagged. Now it's in a training process, certainly, and when the AI cannot tag it or has questions about whether they got the right uh, intent or not, we route the user to our human agent. So we have a small contact center in Nairobi that's also able to take questions during regular working hours, not 24 seven, but you know, from eight to eight, roughly, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday, and answer questions around uh, additional questions consumers may have. So if it goes further afield than an automated question, than our automated library is, uh, covers right now, if it's a related topic that we don't have automated, uh, the human agent will then take it on. So they engage in these questions and answers, this, this kind of conversation through text messaging or through messaging platforms with the intent to call to action. So the consumer, the user, ultimately at the end of the day is asked, and then what? And why is this important? Why are you asking this question? How can we help you get to the next stage? And so working with the consumer to land on this idea of act. What is that act? It might be routing them to Kasha for products that are available through that catalog. It might be routing them to PSK, the Population Services Kenya, or other service providers in the nonprofit sector. Or it might be routing them to a public sector facility for a particular service. But the idea is to operate as a service, as a decision support tool, helping them narrow down the range of options they may be faced with to a narrower, more optimized set of potential actions that they could take. And then it's essentially that cycle again and again. Once they're on the platform and we've addressed one question, uh, we can then follow up with them to see if they have other questions. We can follow up to see if they've acted on the recommendation received. And if they did not, were there barriers? Did they, have, did, they, did they lack cash to buy that product or to seek that service? So the idea is here to help the consumer 
throughout that health journey, answering questions they may have uh, so that at the end of the day, they're able to take action on their own health. That's the, the B to C component of what we do. Next slide, please. And this is the last one. The, the revenue model that we generate around this, so the, big, the, the way in which we stay in business essentially, keep the lights running, keep the servers running, is by forming business partnerships with uh, organizations that are keen to engage either an audience that we may already have on our platform. So in Kenya, we've got close to 400,000 users. In India, we launched last July, and we're over a million users now. Uh, so very quickly, we're, we've been able to engage users, onboard users, and for some of our business partners, or, <clears throat> excuse me, some of our uh, customers in this space are keen to see or keen to engage that user base that we already have um, communicating with Nibby. Now, others have a particular target audience in mind, and we'd like to engage them with the tools available at Nibby. And so we form, uh, uh, we also offer access to the Nibby platform to, to target um, messages and these conversations to their intended beneficiaries. So we, we work with a range of partners on this element of engage or initial marketing, conversation or content delivery, as well as referrals to services and products, self-care products inclusive um, along that user health journey. So that's Nivy and self-care in a nutshell. Over to you, Martha. Okay, unmute me. Thanks, Ben. Thank you very much. An interesting discussion around AI. I did want to just acknowledge it was nice to see that you had used the um, had shown the reference to the uh, BMJ article, and I'm happy to know that I think Dr. Manjula Nasserian is on the line, who actually was the first author of that. So we'll come back to that later. I think Manjula might have some comments to make later, but I think um, anyway, great. So we're going to move on now. We've heard about about uh, you know platforms, and we heard the Kasha model, and now we're going to just um, kind of zoom down to a particular self-care product and talk a little bit about the diaphragm as an example of that. So I'm going to hand this over now to um, uh, Maggie Kilburn Brook. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, very well. Okay. Yes. Go. Okay. Of course, be great. With you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, PATH is providing technical assistance to Kessel Med and Tim for the introduction of the Kaya diaphragm in low and middle income countries. So this presentation really highlights some of the early introduction activities and lessons from our experience. Next slide. Um, perfect. As many of you know, diaphragms have not been supplied as part of international family planning programs in recent decades. In due, part to the difficulty of supplying and providing traditional diaphragms that come in multiple sizes. The new single size diaphragm was developed to address this need and to provide an option for women who are interested in a non-hormonal contraceptive. This innovative design means that it can be supplied outside the traditional clinic setting once a, and because a provider fitting is no longer required. Kaya was developed with public sector funding to expand women's options for non-hormonal contraception, and it's being introduced and marketed by Kessel and their partners. Next slide, please. Kaya was launched first in high-income countries where Kessel had existing distributors and where women and providers were expressing interest in this new method. By the end of the first year, it was approved and being marketed in 12 countries, and now seven years after its initial launch, it's being marketed in more than 40 countries. Kaya distributors, distributors are often young female entrepreneurs or family-run companies that are seeking to respond to women's needs for sexual and reproductive health products in their community. Key to this introduction effort is understanding what women and providers want and need as we're bringing this new product to this market. Next slide, please. Kessel and their partners are using um, this early introduction experience from high income countries to bridge to introduction in low and middle income countries. Uh, Medintim partners with both private and public sector partners as they move forward in low and middle income countries. This slide provides highlights of some of the recent work to register Kaya in low and middle income countries. Danielle Harris, who will speak next, will talk about the ECO project, which is introducing Kaya in Niger. DKT 
is planning introduction in Nigeria later this year, and work is underway for regulatory approval in multiple uh, South American and Latin American countries. Next slide, please. Medintim has created a variety of materials to help introduce this new contraceptive method. These include instructions for use, an animated DVD, a pelvic model, guidelines for healthcare providers. Some of the country distribution partners have their own websites to help build Kaya communities in their local area. Some of the distributors use social media to raise awareness and give opportunities for women to ask questions and to share their experiences. All of these materials are now being adapted for use in low and middle income countries to respond to local needs. Next slide, please. So the next steps are to continue to build on the experience from these early introduction countries to understand what Kaya users want and need, to engage with providers and other stakeholders to create a supportive environment for this new contraceptive method, and to build additional partnerships to expand access. Key lessons from the past few years include the importance of picking the right partners, partners who share your key values, which are to deliver a quality product in a manner that gives women and providers the information they need to use the product successfully and with confidence. Don't be afraid to start small so that we can build next steps based on past successes. And pay attention to what women and users want and make sure that the product is available and the information is available where they want it and you need to be flexible and be willing to adapt. Thank you. Next slide. So Danielle, I think it will be over to you. Thank you, Maggie. Here. Thanks, Maggie. Okay, good, handing over, go. Go, Danielle. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Danielle Harris, and I'm a senior program manager with WCG Cares. I am also the acting deputy director of the USAID funded Expanding Effective Contraceptive Options Project, also called the EGO Project for short. Uh, EGO was designed to address women's method related reasons for non use of contraception, and to this end, introduces new and underutilized methods like the Kaya diaphragm. In this presentation, I'll be highlighting a few key pieces of information from ECO's pilot of the Kaya diaphragm and accompanying Kaya gel in Niger. Next slide, please. ECO conducted formative research with potential users, their partners, and providers to inform the marketing and service delivery strategy. I've listed a few of the key findings on this slide, but I wanted to highlight the last point because users and providers in Niger didn't have any familiarity with the diaphragm, aside from some recognizing it on WHO-produced posters hanging in clinics, we had to be mindful that we were seeking to build a new market for an entirely new product category in the country. ECO developed a marketing plan that placed community health workers as the primary channel of communication and service delivery. Uh, CHWs were to reach out to women as potential adopters of the method in clinic waiting rooms, areas where women gather in the community, and through door-to-door -door outreach. However, we did plan to have one male CHW. The idea would be that he would conduct family planning talks with men as well as advocate with key opinion leaders. And the reason for this was twofold. One, to secure community buy-in and support for the pilot. And two, because we learned during our formative research that women's partners are often consulted in the initial decision to use family planning, so women have a lot more leeway in deciding what method to choose from there. Providers, both in the public and private sectors, were also trained to offer the method. The pricing was based around the cost of the gel. So the initial diaphragm is free with the first purchase of gel, but in reality, the two are sold as a kit for the equivalent of about 80 cents in US dollars. Gel resupplies are then sold for the same price. It's important to note, though, that the pricing only applies for women who access Kaya through the community health workers or providers in private clinics. In public health centers, both the diaphragm and gel resupplies are provided for free. Next slide, please. ECO developed a training curriculum, supervision tools, and communication tools for the pilot launch. Uh, the diaphragm manufacturer, Kessel, also developed a number of tools, including an instructional poster that's being used in Niger and is pictured in the background of this slide. 
In June 2019, ECO held a four-day training, again, in collaboration with the manufacturer, Kessel, on how to counsel and distribute the method. Consistent with the planned service delivery strategy, ECO trained five CHWs, so four women to work directly with clients and one male CHW, and 10 providers. Uh, so that's seven midwives in the public sector and three midwives in the private sector. And I wanted to note that the CHWs and, and providers provide counseling on the full range of contraceptive options available um, just now with Kaya being one of them. The pilot launched directly after the training in June 2019 with an initial procurement of 800 diaphragms and 800 gels. Since then, we've placed additional orders for both diaphragms and gels. Next slide, please. In the first six months of the pilot, so from June to December 2019, there have been 427 diaphragm and gel kits sold and 25, or I'm sorry, 26 gel resupplies. By delivery channel, we know that just under half of women are accessing Kaya through community health workers, about 37% through public health centers and 17% through private clinics. So two notes about this information. Um, we've noticed a shift in where women are accessing Kaya. Initially, it was from the community health workers, but as of late, it's moved to providers in the public health centers where you may remember um, the product is free. So for us, this makes sense because most women in Niger access their family planning methods from the public sector for free. And two, we haven't sold as many gel resupplies as we anticipated. Anecdotally, we hear that women like the gel, but we're not yet seeing that in gel resupply sales. Um, one other thing to know is that so far, about 11% of Kaya adopters are new users of family planning um, entirely. A few months into the pilot, we conducted mystery client research to assess the quality of counseling around the method. Each provider and CHW was visited. In general, the results were really positive, but did reveal some gaps. For example, that providers needed to allow women more time to practice insertion and removal using a pelvic model. And two, that providers in each facility, um, if they were busy, then that meant that the method wasn't available. So we needed to train more providers in the facilities where there was already one. So we actually completed that training last week. Next slide, next and final. So right now our operational research study is underway in Niger. Data collection began in January of this year. So far we've completed all of the in-depth interviews. So that's 25 with Kaya doctors, 15 with men who attended family planning talks and 15 with providers. And data collection for the quantitative portion of the research is ongoing. I've listed some of the key questions we hope to answer on this slide, um, not least of which is the six month discontinuation rate. So we hope to have that soon. So, of course, we are in the middle of our pilot in Niger now and still figuring out what our key lessons learned are, but a few things that I wanted to mention as I wrap up are, um, one, that some of the concerns that were raised during formative research and later during training, like that women would feel unclean if Kaya were inserted during prayer times or that they wouldn't be interested in a vaginally inserted product, um, have not actually been raised during the pilot introduction whatsoever. We've also been flexible to make changes as we go. So for instance, we've realized that door-to-door -door outreach is just too time consuming and not as effective as other methods. So we now reserve this approach for follow-up with women who have questions or concerns that the CHW can address. Um, and we've also realized that the male CHW's time is better spent on working with community uh, key opinion leaders and on community buy-in versus actual family planning talks with men as they rarely if ever resulted in their wives or partners seeking out a community health worker to access Kaya. And with that, I will bring you to an end. Thank you, everyone. You unmute me, unmute me. Thank you, thank you all panelists. And thanks Maggie and Danielle for this last, they, they coordinated their discussions around the diaphragm. I think it was a very interesting example of two different models. I'd like to thank all the panelists very much. Um, I was a little tough, I have to say, as a moderator. I'm like, okay, we've got to stick to time because I really do want to have the opportunity for people to ask questions, which you can do by going into the question box. So we'll look for as we're getting in some questions here. 
um, I'm glad to have a, we have about 15 minutes now, which is great to be able to kind of respond to questions and queries. Um, just a couple thoughts. I, I have my own questions, but I'll hold them until we get some others. Um, we'll try and we'll try. I mean, there's much to talk about the overall self-care movement and conversations around that, but we're trying actually at this particular juncture, given that this is the supplies coalition, we want to see those that more linked to products and supplies, particularly, I think, for this discussion. But um, are we seeing any online? I, sorry. Okay, this is that too. I mean, a couple of questions here, just um, I'm gonna try and batch them together. Questions actually from Malay, Malay that Kasha. I mean, a couple of, couple of questions that are coming up. One is just generally around determining price points for different products and how that all works. Um, another, I'll just give you a couple of points that are coming up. The other is about how you go about procuring the supplies for Kasha. I mean, you must do that in bulk or something. If you could talk a little bit about that. And then um, how, how do you, let's say, yeah, how, I don't know if that's to her, how do you fulfill prescription drugs online? That's for Kasha. So I don't know if those, Malays, can you speak to those kind of general comments, questions? Um, sure, sure. So regarding the price point, um, it depends on what types of product, but generally for all the products on our platform, we do conduct market research to understand what is the price point that people are used to. And for products that are more uh, impact-based, so for example, emergency contraceptives, whenever it's possible, we try to have a price that's slightly lower because we're also impact-driven, but usually our rule of thumb is to meet whatever the pricing is within our market of operations for the products that we have on our platform. Um, and we, in terms of procurement, we work with suppliers, registered suppliers for all of our products generally. I do want to point out that we are not a registered pharmacy. So for our pharmaceutical products, we have pharmacy partners both in Rwanda and Kenya that are completely registered, um, already have branches, multiple branches open. They're both wholesalers, so they're able to import as well pharmaceutical products. And so we procure all of our products through their branches. Um, in Kenya, we have a branch within our warehouse at the moment with a pharmacist that is able to support as well in fulfilling any prescription required orders. And in Rwanda, we also uh, have all the prescriptions orders uh, basically reviewed for authenticity by one of our partner pharmacists. So what would happen to walk you through the step is that you would place an order for a pharmaceutical product. We would, uh, you would already be aware by looking at our website or by someone calling you and saying, this product requires a prescription, do you have one? If you have one, you can share it over email or WhatsApp. And then we basically have a pharmacist review it for authenticity. And once they confirm, only then can we uh, deliver the product to the customer. So at the moment, that's how we're uh, fulfilling prescription orders. And I also want to point out that regulations differ from country to another. So uh, for example, in Kenya, if you have a prescription product on the website, um, there is no image. You can't show an image of the actual packaging. You can have some type of animation, and then you have price and information on the product, but you can't show an image of the package. So we're also aware of these regulations and follow them generally. Okay, great. Thank you. Because there was one other question about regulatory, and I guess you've sort of spoken to that about, um, yeah, what was the question here? Um, sorry, I'm looking at questions. They're just coming in. I'm trying to kind of collate them together um, about any legal or regulatory challenge that challenges that you might be facing at Kasha. Yeah, so I think it's, yeah, I just gave one example is how yeah. countries can work differently. <laughs> And so just being yeah. aware of that, what works and doesn't work. Um, and just generally, it is something new. So you can see that those who are in, um, who have been working in the pharmacy in industry might have more traditional views. But once you explain your, your way of doing things and that really, again, no one is uh, fulfilling prescription products without verifying that people have prescriptions, then uh, they're okay. <laughs> Thank you. And one other question for you, and also I think for Ben about the AIs in the Kasha platform. Is there an opportunity for um, client feedback? You know, how did how does your client provide feedback in that platform? User feedback, let's say. Yes. Oh, sure. So Kasha side, if you're using the online platform, we have surveys. So generally, and there are two ways. Uh, immediately on the website, uh, there's a pop up that can come up, and then we ask you to sort of. Uh, 
uh, grade your service with us. And then also generally uh, for people that place orders using our online platform, they, they provide us they provide us with their email. So we're able to send them questions afterwards that if they want, they can answer, which also helps us in order of um, customers providing feedback. They can also review products actually on our platform and speak about their experiences, if they like the product, did it work for them. So that's also another option online. And then offline customers can call our uh, call center. Um, and for low-income community customers, they can go through our agents as well. So that's another way for customers to communicate their challenges. We also find that a lot of customers use social media cha uh, channels, so Instagram, Facebook, and they will message us directly or maybe post something and tag us in terms of providing us with feedback, uh, whether positive or even negative. So that's not another channel where we get feedback from consumers. Thank you very much. I'm wondering, thanks, Melis. I'm wondering, um, Ben, do you have a comment as do you have a comment as well about how do you gather user feedback from the Nivi platform, the Nivi platform? Nivi. Um, Nivi. Nivi. Feedback comes well, we gauge it several different ways. One, we can understand where the consumer is at on how they're accessing the conversations. If there's been a, a lapse or a lull in the conversation, for instance, we could send a nudge or a reminder, check in essentially to see how they are or where they're at uh, conceptually uh, along their health journey. You know, how are they feeling that day? And um, and then post service or once a recommendation has been made for that critical action stage, uh, whether it's a self care or a behavioral change component or a referral to seek care or services elsewhere, uh, the feedback or the, 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 the more active engagements around nudges or reminders. And if they have taken uh, taken action, gone to the clinic, we can ask, well, how was it? And so they'll rate the service. Uh, we currently collect ratings on a five-star basis, but we could imagine for Femme Plan, for instance, uh, gauging their quality of interpersonal communication around the, the method information index. You know, we could roll out those three questions. Uh, or more generally thinking about uh, the, the, the net promoter score, would they recommend this to their friends? There's opportunities here to build in that sort of routine check uh, any number of ways on the platform post-service post, uh, take-up. You. One other question for you, just while I have you on the line, Ben, is a question about um, is the um, are you working also in India and is the messaging and the is that contextualized for India and Kenya separately? I mean, your platform. Right, that's a great yeah. question. We have in in, in Kenya the language we do it in or we can communicate in English and Swahili both. In India, it's English and Hindi. Um, about I think seventy or eighty percent of our users are using the Hindi version of the conversations. Uh, we just launched the platform in July last year. Uh, the initial part of the launch, it was a soft launch, if you will. I, mean, I think it's pretty pretty successful with, with a million users as a soft launch, but it, it was really looking at initial engagement plus automated conversations. So we have conversations around SRH, uh, particularly around contraceptives, and then medication abortion for uh, information around MA at, we've done a pilot around Lucknow with about 100 pharmacies as a post-sales point of um, information point, almost like an automated helpline. So the conversations in India are fully automated. Uh, we've just uh, signed with PSI and in India uh, Limited, so we're going to do the um, we're going to begin building out the referral base with uh, or points of care through uh, PSI pharmacies or PSI sorry not pharmacies PSI clinics. Uh, as well as other partners as they come on board. So that referral piece is going to expand over time and that'll deepen the health journey capabilities over the next six months. Great, thank you. And I, I just assume if one were to do this in other countries, you would contextualize that with language, et cetera, in whatever locale, as a general you know, principle. Part of the launch, yeah. again, following demand, you know, wherever there's interest from partners on the ground, yes, there's a localization yeah. process with the contact yeah. in every market yeah. we enter. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. Great. Okay. Thank you, Ben. There's a there's a batch of questions related to the Kaya diaphragm. So I'll just um, kind of this is for both Danielle and Maggie in some ways. Looking at a couple of questions that arise was the issue around market share and utilization questions. Um, I and also the question of sort of I mean in the case Maggie you talked about about more of a what lack of a better word I'd call the business to business model approach versus something that's more focused on public sector. Can one of you or 
combine your co combine your comments to give us the group a little bit of a sense of these very different models how you know what do you look like in terms of market share and sort of sustainability questions i don't know if that's to maggie or yeah um yeah this is this is maggie and i'll take that one on first um i think the first thing that i would say is that um when the kaya diaphragm came to market in 2013 the the existing manufacturers of diaphragms were letting the entire category die out so our goal was to get this product approved while there still was a diaphragm on the market i mean th there are multiple reasons why manufacturers we're allowing this product category to die out. It's a very low cost product. It's reusable for up to two years. So the return on investment for, from a manufacturer's perspective, there are other products that will give them greater value. Um, it, it's categorically not been promoted or supplied. So, so we were entering a market that, that doesn't even show up on health indicators you know on the unfpa measurements of how many women use the diaphragms or dhs surveys so i mean you have to understand we're starting from a very very small market but what what in in markets where they have been able to collect information when they look at how many products are sold you know this is increasing year after year so i think those are the trends that we see that are actually encouraging. There's a greater interest in by women in access to non-hormonal contraceptives, and that is building over time. So um, I think that's a very positive kind of um, a, a very positive kind of movement. Uh, in terms of sustainability, the reason that I want this the model that Kessel does have is business person to, to business to small business person. And I'm particularly interested in this because I think many times there are social technologies or technologies for health that languish because we have a difficult time finding the right kind of commercialization partner who actually understands the product, is interested in building a market, and is willing to start small and and then see where it can grow over time and what i've seen with these business relationships with family run companies that are established in their community is that the the ones that are most successful are the ones where they're looking for products that they think will meet the needs of the consumers in their community and um, it's a very interesting role model and that the language that we have about are you selling to the private sector or the public sector or what channels are you going through sometimes that language doesn't seem to be as relevant because in many of these countries it's there is public sector and there is private sector but these technologies are moving beyond those kinds of boundaries you know they're just they're selling to consumers or they're selling to providers or they're selling to clinics and the clinics themselves may be subsidized by the government but this isn't necessarily i i think we need to rethink some of our language around are you selling to the public sector or the private sector because sometimes those distinctions aren't as easy to pay attention to but all of those efforts in those 40 countries where the diaphragm is being marketed, those are all sustainable situations. They're not being supported by USAID or UNFPA or IPPF. Thanks, Maggie. I think that was a very important contribution. And I do think that, that, that what you've described actually is an interesting model that in the era of self-care, I think will be only increasingly important. So thanks for that. And that uh, dissection and I quite agree language is not our friend here when you're talking about and I think Danielle you mentioned it as well when you're basically kind of creating and shaping a market de novo right so it doesn't fit into all those kind of general metrics that we have in this field right so thank you for that I wonder if Danielle last question to you people were interested in some of the research the operational research you were doing and the looking at the um how you were developing your user profiles could you take a word about that Sure. So our operational research is underway now. Um, the, I guess a clarifying question would mean, do you mean the user profile? So we, we did a, a formative research in 2017 to help us figure out what we thought our market would look like um, and the most compelling messages for that market. And that was 
in the information I shared in the formative research slide. So the most compelling messaging we learned was that Kaya was non-hormonal and user controlled. It could be used on demand. Um, for the operational research that's underway now, um, we're learning more about the sociodemographic profile of our users. Um, but I, maybe if there's a, a more specific question I could get to, um, or Martha, if you wanted to like redirect that somehow in a, in a way that I could give more information about what we're doing. Oh, I think that I think that was I think that was fine. It was sort of you know I'm trying to tease out the exact question someone's posing. Okay. I know I think you've, you've done a good job on that, but I think I think between you and Maggie, I think this was a very interesting kind of. Um, discussion around these very kind of different models for products that are what I think are incredibly important and needed, but yet are, don't don't rise into the family planning lexicon as much. Although I'm hopeful that they will, particularly around self care. Quite honestly, we shall see. I mean, I think it'll be actually interesting to follow this now within the self care context to see if you're actually seeing an increase in that. Um, so I'm just looking at. We have some other questions here or there, but. Um, we're also, well, we have three minutes left. Okay, good. We do have three minutes here. Um, okay, oh, here was a question. This was um, uh, related to um, uh, the digital platforms. Oh, how, in the case of Kasha, um, are you able to do uh, counseling services in relation to any of the products? I mean, how does that work again? Providing sort of information, counseling. Yes, uh, sure. So as I said, one of the services that we offer our, it's also telephone consultation with registered nurses and doctors. And so via this service, if uh, consumers have questions or they're not sure, maybe they, they're not even sure that they need a product, they want to understand, um, then they're able to use this service. And also at any time, they could always be connected to a pharmacist before to maybe receive counseling more around the direction of how to use the product. So these two are the counseling services that we currently offer. Thank you. Thank you for that. There's also some questions about clarifying people's names. Who am I? I'm Martha Brady. I'm the Director of Sexual Reproductive Health and Path. I mean, we, we will be sending out, I mean, I think the notes get sent out as also, um, if they want speaker contacts, can those be provided? Yes, the speaker contacts can be provided to the to the listserv. So if anyone wants any further information from any one of the panelists, um, that's, uh, that's allowed. Um, sorry, I'm just putting this on hold while I read anymore. Um, any other questions online? Um, let me see. Put this. Let me put this on hold for one second. Okay. There's questions here about that was you know saying you know uh, contraceptive self injection wasn't uh, talked about today. And yes, we there have been just to, to the to the question there. There have been in many many um, consultations and panels on contraceptive self injection, the DMPA SC. Um, and so we elected not to cover this at this moment, but just briefly, um, I think that that is in fact one of the self-care, um, self-injection is considered one of the self-care um, technologies. It was actually reviewed by WHO. Um, it's in the w most recent WHO guidelines. Um, I think self-injection is increasingly um, uh, happening in many countries. There are now policies in place in several countries in adopting that. And so there's both the real potential, many of us on the line here, the PATH and others are actually both involved, actively involved in the rolling out of self-injection in many countries and following that and doing research, operations research around that. So there's much to be said. Um, if, the, if the person would like more, we can send you, we can direct you on to a number of resources. Um, yeah, we just had to limit our time here. I mean, there's many other, we'd love to have another topic on uh, self-medication uh, abortion and also on the HPV self-sampling for cervical cancer as another topic of great interest to many. But we had to sort of, we had to land on a few here. So this is what we landed on for today because we're out of time apparently. I see we're, yeah, do, do people, do they fall off or no, we have to, I guess we're gonna close it up. So I would like to one, thank all the panelists very much and sorry if I was tough with you, but to keep, to keep your, your, your um, speaking short, but I think it was helpful and very much appreciate it. And thank you all online. Um, and there'll be notes coming out from the NERC caucus. Um, so I'll sign off for here, from here in Washington. Stay safe and wash your hands. Thank <laughs> you, Martha. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you all, wonderful. <laughs>